Hey, Taja. Hey, David. How you doing? Hey, Paul. Hey, everybody. All right. All right. So just, just so people know, you know, we do these videos. And it's really important to us that we get the story right from the perspective of the storyteller. And Tanja waited until she didn't look at the draft. She didn't look at the final draft. She didn't look at it after it was published. I mean, you know, hundreds of people had seen it. And then Tanja watches it. So, Tanja, you, you, you were rolling the dice with that. Yeah, I really was, you know, but, you know, I trusted you and that story had never been told. That's the first time it's been told. And so I knew you were the person to do it. And yeah, I waited to process it on yesterday with my therapist. And uh, but I gotten hundreds of calls with people just, you know, mad, sad, excited. And pe not only were people amazed with the story, but how beautiful that you and Justin told it. And you guys, y'all kick butt. It was uh, almost Justin, like looking at somebody else's stuff. I love Justin's. What did Kendall say? Kendall was like, uh, she cried a lot and she was just like amazed. And um, she asked, you know, could she use it, you know, to send to some of her peers? And I said, sure. So uh, sh everybody was blown away. Everybody, my family, you know, I didn't realize the impact that it was going to have on them. And, you know, they were very apologetic that they weren't there for me. And look, Aww. it's all good. Yeah, but people were really amazed, particularly people who had no, who know me. And like with Tanja, I was interacting with you during that time. And I'm so sorry that you were hurting so much and we didn't know it, so. Well, I was shocked, Tanja, that there were aspects of the story that are still coming out as a result yep. of this. You didn't realize you assumed the chain of events was family member to family member. And it was a little bit more happenstance than that. Uh, and, 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 oh my God, it, it sort of made me shudder to realize uh, that was closer than we even thought it was. Tanya. It was, and you know, like I said, I, my, my recollections of that night of that whole experience was pretty on point, but some of the things that I was not, you know, clearly in my right mind and I always thought I was. And so now hearing what Trey said and, uh, what I did do, David, is on Monday, I requested my medical records from the ER. I got some of them. I'm waiting on the other ones when they actually, you know, did the evalu evaluation. Um, right. The chief of police is helping me get the 911 call from that night. And oh then I'm also God. waiting on the records from the actual hospital because some of the stuff I thought I knew, but I didn't. Well, look, as you get that information, Justin will be interested. You know, we're going to stitch all of these into a documentary film at the end of it. So uh, that, 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 that all might be uh, helpful to, for that final product. Yeah. And I, I, yesterday I got, a, uh, I got a, um, a call from GMA and they're shopping the story. And they said that they would let me know something, I think by, I think they said Monday, but they were very interested. So, um, you know, stand by for that. I think that's pretty cool. Tanja, you're a runaway train right now, aren't you? I don't know. I'm just trying to make sure the track I'm on is the track that's going to really bust up a lot of stuff and help a lot of people. Well, Tanja, when you say bust up a lot of self and stuff and help a lot of people, one of the things I got earlier this week, and I don't know if you saw this, but uh, there, you're going to hear about SAMHSA pushing out $100 million to advance mobile crisis, but Chairman Delor or Chairwoman DeLaurel actually uh, cited uh, some of your testimony and some of that work you did in the mental health emergencies hearing is influencing that work. So uh, you are changing the world. Well, That's hey, crazy. Ter terrific, both of you. So it's nine o'clock, which means it's time to uh, rock the crisis jam forward. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, Dr. Anitra, Anitra Warrior uh, presenting a uh, crisis line for all nations. Uh, that was brought to us by Shelby Rowe. Shelby is, has been a ter terrific champion uh, in this learning community around uh, issues, particularly for tribal nations. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to start today. Uh, today's Washington Post, uh, the lead story is that 93,000 people died of drug overdose uh, in 2020, up 30% up over the very significant numbers that we have been seeing over the recent years. Uh, Case and Deaton uh, brought us this terrible idea of the deaths of despair, this combination of suicide deaths, alcohol-related deaths, uh, and uh, the deaths related to the illicit uh, uh, expansion of fentanyl. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, Mike Hogan, I don't know if you're on the line, but you've, uh, uh, you've supposed that uh, up to a third of those overdose deaths are probably a, a, a suicide, and certainly all of them are, are tragic. And as we launch down this path, uh, 988 it brings together this history of the lifeline, which has been primarily focused on uh, suicide prevention, and yet we've always had people in mental health crisis and substance use crisis calling that line, and local and state and county crisis lines, which uh, uh, significantly serve. Uh, historically, we've seen about a third of calls coming into local county crisis lines are for some level of substance use crisis, with um, the, the most recent data I saw for one of those statewide lines was 34% were for substance use with 14% of that, the substance use was primary and 20% being a co-occurring issue. So something we're definitely going to want to continue to lean into. And that sets the stage for this week's uh, Margie's crisis meme. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Karen. Uh, Margie, are you with us today? Yes, I am here. So Margie, uh, Lord of the Rings hits a second uh, crisis meme, but I think the message behind this one is really important. So set this up for folks if you would. Yeah, I mean, this is basically, it's both the risk and the opportunity that 988 brings, which is that, I mean, for all the reasons you said, 988 is awesome, but it's gonna need a crisis system to connect to. So um, we need to make sure that we build it. Otherwise we can actually make some of our like overwhelming ER problems worse. Right. So let's let's go to the next slide. And, and uh, Margie, in particular, the uh, you've got both mobile crisis and crisis receiving facilities in your crisis meme slide. And, and Sarah Corcoran is going to hit uh, the opportunities, Paul, you were setting up right before the call in much more depth. But this uh, planning grant uh, funding for mobile crisis from Medicaid, I thought was just stunning as this tsunami wave of momentum around crisis continues. I wonder if uh, Kirsten Baranio happens to be with us to make a couple of comments. Kirsten, are you in the learning community today? Hey, David. Yes, I'm here. So uh, this uh, up to $15 million per state on planning grant funding specifically for mobile crisis intervention services. Now, we've seen the $9 million investment across states from Lifeline around 988 and the continuum of crisis care. We've seen the 5% set aside from SAMHSA and now this additional opportunity for Medicaid. What was your take on this, Kirsten? Yeah, I, you know, we've been waiting for this to come out. I was happy to see it. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, what I think is really helpful about this particular um, opportunity is it creates an, an, an opportunity for state mental health and substance use disorder leaders to really work with their Medicaid agencies. So there's a lot of funding, um, you know, been hearing a lot from state leaders about all the block grant funding that they're, you know, kind of working to try to um, put to good use and you know, the HCBS uh, funding is another way to sort of think about how Medicaid can support some of this work going forward. I think the block grant funding is a tremendous opportunity to do a lot of, you know, new and innovative things, but, um, you know, not clear how much of that will continue going forward. So I'm hopeful that states can use this opportunity as well as the HCBS opportunity to really kind of think about how you um, incorporate Medicaid better into supporting some of these services going forward. So I think this planning grant um, offers, um, you know, a little infusion of cash um, to help states with that process because it will bring together Medicaid and behavioral health. I uh, so really appreciate I that, have. Kirsten. I I did want to point out it's not, you know, I don't, I don't think it was well um, advertised, but there is a webinar tomorrow um, at, at one o'clock Eastern. Um, yeah, and, and I think Christy has the link in the chat for, for that. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure to share that information. And I haven't had a chance to get out the email distribution yet, but we'll, we'll put that in. And, uh, you know, this, this idea of community-based mobile teams that go to where the individual is, uh, not, not meeting them at the hospital or the local community mental health clinic, 
but seeing them at the apartment, on the street, in their home, at the social service agency, wherever they are. This is a transformative idea, and it really does have the potential to radically transform the overuse and over-reliance on hospitals and law enforcement. Uh, so we're really excited about this. And uh, Kirsten, you're setting up some of the other content. So we'll, we'll go directly into that. Let's go to the next slide, Karen. Uh, and, and I think uh, the SAMHSA team is in another meeting, but Richard, I believe you're with us for uh, an update at the beginning of the call. Uh, that, that, that's correct, David. The SAMHSA team sends our, our regrets, but we wanted to make sure we were able to give you at least a brief update, and then I'll need to hop off the call. So um, I, I'm going to mention uh, two things. So, you know, first off, I mentioned previously how the inaugural meeting of the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services took place um, a week or two ago. Uh, we are now in the process of, of setting up within just the next couple of weeks, the inaugural meeting of the <clears throat> subcommittee on suicide prevention and crisis care um, of, the, of the BHCC. And this subcommittee is co-chaired and by our new assistant secretary, Miriam Delphin Rittman, as well as the CDC director, Rachel Walensky. So you, you, that obviously communicates the high level interest and every operating division, every staff division, every part of uh, the US Department of, of Health and Human Services has been um, um, uh, invited to participate in that. And so far we are getting a very robust response. We just uh, heard confirmation from CMS uh, you know, this morning. Um, this will be the um, strongest, most coordinated effort in suicide prevention and crisis care within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, certainly that I have ever seen. Um, and combine that with the work that convened by the White House Domestic Policy Council, you know, we're really talking about uh, an unprecedented federal response as, as we're gearing up for suicide prevention in general, but with 988 and, and, and transformed crisis services, um, you know, at, at the heart of that agenda. The second thing I'll just mention is that SAMHSA is currently working on a voluminous work plan regarding 988, trying to identify everything that needs to be done, who, who's gonna be doing it on what timeline, um, you know, and um, with the expectation we'll be expanding this to other federal partners and, and private partners being out. So um, there's a tr just a tremendous amount of, of activity, planning, work, uh, you know, going on, um, activities around uh, uh, what needs to be done in terms of public awareness and communication, what needs to be done in terms of coordination with 911 had a call with the Office of Emergency Medical Services and Vibrant and SAMHSA today. Um, um, and of course, making sure that there's adequate capacity uh, to answer 988 calls and to be able to um, have what occurs afterwards, after the call is answered, uh, to be linked to appropriate services. And um, uh, based on Margie's meme, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll consider, you know, inviting uh, Boromir onto a, a uh, advisory committee. <laughs> so, Richard, a couple of things. First, uh, I, I remember a paper that Dr. Jerry Reed and De Quincey Lazine wrote uh, some years ago, calling, really saying the difference that was needed in this effort was political will. And this unprecedented federal response you're talking about strikes me as exactly what they were ultimately hoping for. The, the other thing, uh, uh, Richard, I was just curious about this voluminous work plan. In your long and productive career, Richard, have you been involved in anything? Uh, uh, what, what has risen to the level of this report uh, in your mind? Anything? Only the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, I would yeah. say, would be equivalent. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, Richard. Uh, uh, Brian Hepburn, are you with us for an update from the States? 
Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you to Richard. That's pretty exciting stuff that's going on and the states are excited. Uh, we had a couple of calls this morning. Uh, one was with Jessica Pollard from Maine and asked, we were asking, well, how are things going on in Maine? And she said, well, we're feeling overwhelmed, but optimistic. So I think that's a good way of summarizing how states are feeling moving to post COVID. I think as everybody knows, there are some pockets where we're not post COVID, but in terms of developing strategies, states are really looking at what are those strategies that would really take us through the post COVID period. So uh, we had a, a good call with Jessica. She was talking about the importance of workforce, in-home stabilization, all tied in with crisis services. We also had a, another good call this morning with uh, Commissioner Gertrude Mutemba Mutosa, uh, Mutasa and uh, Paul Fleischner. Uh, and uh, Minnesota is doing some really exciting things. They're looking at this time period uh, as transformative. And I think that's very consistent with what you were just hearing from Richard, that this is a transformative period and uh, states are identifying gaps, especially in the kids' mental health services, looking at how do we establish a model using crisis services where we're keeping kids out of uh, situations where they would end up being institutionalized and instead strengthening, strengthening the in-home supports uh, so that crisis services, mobile crisis services go out to the kids, to the family, provide support there, and then there's ongoing stabilization in the home. So it's really exciting what's going on. We know that every state is dealing with workforce shortages. They're dealing with the need for more data, uh, but it's very interesting the way that the transformative is inclusive of crisis services and the crisis services are often the hub uh, that, that's going to make everything else work. So uh, thank you and good work. Thanks Rich, uh, to Richard and, uh, Thanks to David. Best wishes. Uh, great, great stuff, Brian. Overwhelmed but optimistic uh, that the amount of funding and the time to, to push that forward in a thoughtful way, all challenging us, but uh, this transformative opportunity that, uh, that you've talked about, this is really great. And if you're keeping score at home, I think, Brian, that's four or five weeks in a row uh, that you've referenced the post-COVID strategy. So we'll, we'll keep, keep that moving and uh, hopefully continue to make that a reality. Uh, next slide, Karen. Uh, we continue to track the uh, state engagement and uh, several of you have uh, sent us through uh, participants from Medicaid authorities that are already in this learning community and we don't have reflected. So I believe there's still a couple of states that are engaged and we don't yet have you as blue on the map. So please let us know if you've got Medicaid partners who are participating in this learning community. And if you don't, then uh, outreach uh, the folks that are, that are uh, uh, our partners and uh, working with these very significant opportunities we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, the same thing if you're a national organization and you're not listed on the left, please, please let us know. Uh, we've not yet broken that uh, 272 uh, mark that we had on the call uh, a few weeks ago, right before July 4th. So we'll uh, continue to track uh, how do we bust through 300. We talked last week about uh, inviting uh, others to, to join. Uh, so uh, we'll continue to uh, track that. And hopefully uh, I've been teeing up the engagement of some of our international partners. We're gonna try to get them featured on the call as we go forward. Next slide, Karen. And again, if you miss a call, the videos, the transcripts and all of the materials, the presentations, uh, the tools that have come out, Dr. Uh, John Franklin Sierra's uh, dispatch protocol with Captain Gannon in LA County uh, that was very popular. That is a, a standalone uh, uh, download on the site, uh, as well as the quotes. And now Margie's crisis memes, you can download those from, from the site as well. Next slide here. Uh, Brian, last week, uh, well, actually, before we get to that, uh, uh, Stephanie Hepburn, are you with us for yeah. uh, the, uh, and we published the crisis talk a day early. Uh, because of the uh, deadline for states to submit their HCBS funding. Uh, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, wh where we think that stands. And, uh, and hopefully Tom is with us for some comments. 
Yeah. So I interviewed Tom Betlock, and he's the former director of Arizona's Medicaid program, uh, the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. And he talked about um, how states can use the Medicaid one year HCBS funding bump to expand their crisis systems. And I did a little bit of research also on the spending plans that have already been released. The deadline, like you said, was on Monday. Um, but maybe Tom and Kirsten can talk a little bit about what sort of flexibility there might be if states contact CMS. Um, but uh, Indiana, for example, they have their proposed HCBS spending plan directly invests um, in behavioral health crisis care and 988 implementation. Um, and inside of their plan, it, they, they state uh, that they're interested in developing a robust crisis system predicated on the crisis now model, including core crisis elements in SAMHSA's national guidelines for behavioral health crisis care. Um, Massachusetts was less direct. However, they put in their spending plan um, they, that earlier this year, they actually released a behavioral health reform roadmap and so they'll be using the enhanced federal match, which is about roughly 500 million to help fund that roadmap. And that and it entirely includes uh, the crisis system. So, um, and community-based alternatives for behavioral health to the emergency department. And that includes 24 seven community and mobile crisis intervention services. I also talk about California um, and that focuses more about what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, kids and and the the impacts the impact of, uh, on kids during um, the pandemic and and really being able to get ahead of crises or or uh, facilitate teachers to understand what to look out for um, and you know Tom also went into what's worked in Arizona um, and and I think the part that was really critical uh, was he was talking about how vital it is for there to be a single entity responsible for a crisis system. I know he's talked about that a little bit briefly um, in previous meetings, but um, it was just really interesting and important, I think, for states to look out how, how can this be managed and how can there be a single entity that's responsible in the way that Arizona has done it. Maybe Tom can talk a little bit about that, um, how there's uh, funding that's provided to the managed care organizations. There are three in Arizona and there's a certain dollar amount per member Per month. Tom, are you on the line? I am. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks yeah. again so much. You did a great job as always in terms of taking complex information and boiling it down. So I uh, appreciate the article and the opportunity to speak with you and, and have this information presented and pushed out into the community. Uh, in Arizona, as just as you described, there are organizations that represent each of three regions where they are the single uh, point of accountability and establishing and creating a crisis system and the funding is braided. The Medicaid piece is a capitated amount that's specifically for crisis. As far as I know, Arizona is the only state that capitates a uh, plan on a per member per month basis specifically for crisis services based on the crisis now model. So um, hopefully states can look to that and replicate that. To me, it really expresses the commitment in terms of Medicaid financing for crisis. But of course, you're we also braid in other funding streams in Arizona as well. So there's SAMHSA dollars, there's state only dollars. Um, and really it needs to be that way to provide crisis infrastructure for all Arizonans. So uh, again, great job, a shout out to Indiana uh, and their plan. And we can make that link available so that you can see that. But just as Stephanie described, you know, their plan identified an investment, a total investment for HCBS of 877 million. They put 30% of it or $263 million towards service capacity expansion. And crisis was one of four items listed there. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, Indiana speaks to a significant investment they're willing to make to expand their crisis now infrastructure. So uh, I did want to highlight that as a specific example of the HCBS spending plan. Also, if, if your state has published their spending plan, in all likelihood, there's other opportunities uh, to go back and engage your state leadership on the Medicaid side to talk about these issues, to be able to uh, identify in some instances where the plan may not be completely flushed out. There will be quarterly updates as the state works through this. They had to compile a lot of information in a very short time frame. So 
So everybody take some of that time and continue to flush out ideas. Um, and there's other examples like in Arizona where they set aside some money to do a needs assessment, gaps assessment type of thing to look at the behavioral health infrastructure and where there's gaps, um, they're gonna make investments. So if they find, for example, that the kids crisis system requires additional investments, you know, that should show up in the gap assessment. And that's part of what they plan on investing in the second and third year of this. And one final thing I'll just touch on briefly, David, I know I'm well past five seconds for finance discussions, um, is look for HCBS to be a continued topic at the federal level as it relates to congressional policy discussions. Senate Bill 2210 was introduced and it basically extends this increased 10% FMAP bump. And as we've talked about before, it's really not 10%, it's a lot more than that. Um, and it includes a lot more than HCBS, including behavioral health services, uh, basically for 10 years. And if it's 10 years, it's probably on infinitum, right? Um, and so look for that discussion to occur as part of the overall infrastructure legislation that will be moving forward. Um, and so more to come on HCBS. Stephanie, great job. David, back to you. Thanks so much, Tom. And we do have some slides on Indiana. So if there's anything else to say, we'll, we'll get to that under the crisis calculator section. But I really appreciate Tom bringing their proposal forth. So Karen, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I was referencing, uh, well, actually, we'll, we'll just uh, uh, quickly reference and We talked a little bit, for those of you who were on the call earlier, uh, Tanja Miles, who uh, uh, received a lot of attention for her faith-based uh, addiction recovery effort with her husband, Darren, <coughs> back, uh, was featured in, in George Bush's State of the Union back in the early 2000s, uh, but has uh, struggled throughout her life uh, uh, with, with suicidality and been in crisis. Uh, and we had the wonderful opportunity to tell her story. That is uh, online at uh, Moving America's Soul on Suicide or M. Uh, masosfilm.com. So uh, Tanja, just for lack of time, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have some comments from Tanja uh, uh, in, in a future uh, meeting, but Tanja's uh, testified before Congress a couple of times recently uh, about her efforts um, and uh, really appreciate her dedication and, and the mission she's made around advancing uh, crisis care. And, and Tanja, it's, it's, it's mental health, uh, a minority mental health uh, month. Tom, do you want to make a quick comment? Tanja, are you there? Tanja was with us, but she may, may be having some technical difficulties. Uh, so let's go, let's go to the next slide, Karen. Uh, we also, our quote of the week, uh, and this is the second week in a row, we, we're drawing directly from the crisis jam from the prior week, but I thought Dr. Uh, uh, Sims' uh, comments last week and this particular statement, the cri critical need for connection in times of crisis. Look, uh, many of us are clinicians ourselves and have supported people. Many of us have been in an in a, uh, extraordinarily dark place ourselves and uh, the, the response that we typically provide in this nation uh, is some combination of isolation or containment or delay or even law enforcement engagement. And uh, it's very damaging. In fact, what's needed is simple human connection. Uh, we call it good contact in clinical terms or uh, the Lifeline did a, a terrific uh, uh, paper years ago setting out a framework uh, that talked about collaboration and engagement. Uh, so Dr. Sims, and in particular, Dr. Sims was referencing not only uh, uh, crisis care in 988 overall, but a, a, a race and equity lens. So wanted to draw that out as uh, just the bullseye that we're looking for. Uh, Dr. Sims, are you with us for a quick comment? Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, next slide, Karen. Uh, Sarah Corcoran, are you with us? There is a, uh, a just a mammoth amount of activity. We've already referenced some of it, but uh, try to uh, highlight for us everything that's going on right now. Yes, absolutely. And you are uh, absolutely right, David. There's a lot going on, especially in the last 24 to 48 hours. Just very quickly on that infrastructure piece, the uh, Senate Democrats um, came to an agreement on a $3.5 trillion price tag for 
their uh, infrastructure package. This is the package that will likely go through that reconciliation process that you only need a simple majority to pass it in the Senate. And that is the, the package that Tom was referencing earlier that would likely have that home and community-based services bill as, as part of that. That's the more human infrastructure piece. And we uh, had a few weeks ago, a $600 billion bipartisan infrastructure package that came uh, was agreed upon. And we don't have a lot of details about what would be specifically in either, but we expect the more human infrastructure, less traditional physical infrastructure to be in that one with the much higher price tag. So we'll provide details when we get more information on that in the coming weeks. But the big news of the day is the appropriations uh, Labor, House, and Human Services FY22 bill came out on Sunday, as well as the committee report language about an hour and a half ago. Uh, just starting to dig through it. It's a lot of information, but a lot of great information. Uh, they've got the full committee markup tomorrow morning, and they've increased the overall block grant funding for the mental health block grant to $1.58 billion. That's about $850 uh, million higher than last year. Uh, the crisis care set aside was set at that 10% level that we've been pushing for, so that's great news. The lifeline was funded at 113 um, million. And finally, a new, uh, there's a lot more in there and we're still digging through, but the final highlight that I think is worth sharing right now is that there is a new mental health crisis response partnership pilot program that's $100 million and it's uh, built to help communities create mobile crisis response teams. There is actually text that I found specifically in the bill that I'll drop into the chat, specifically highlighting that the reason this was funded and created is because of that hearing that Tanja and others were a part of um, a couple months back. So it's very exciting and it's really great that in the summary of the program, before they get into the nuts and bolts, they say specifically it's because of hearing about the, the great work that communities are doing that they've wanted to fund this at this level and create this new program. So that's great news. We'll keep digging and seeing what else we can find in there, but a lot of good, a lot of good stuff coming out of the house and we are still waiting on the Senate. No change there as of now. Um, Sarah, can you, thanks so much for that. Can you take a quick look at Wendy Tigreen's uh, question here? Yeah, absolutely. And also I'm happy to answer questions in the chat if you wanna move on to the next piece, but let me see, infrastructure plan. Um, okay, so yes, we don't know for sure what's gonna happen in the, in the partisan uh, $3.5 trillion package for the, for the infrastructure. We don't know, but there's a lot of advocacy to push over the next week to two weeks to make sure that that is included. Uh, Senate Democrats originally wanted $6 trillion for that uh, partisan package. Um, it is a lower sum, but we don't know for sure what is going to be a part of it. But that, um, that Senate bill, the Casey Senate bill that was released a couple weeks back, was crafted by the K Senator Casey staff purely to be that home and community-based services long-term care piece of the Biden plan. So I think it's a more likely than not at this point, if I'm you know, putting my own crystal ball out there, uh, but since the, the price tag is lower than what some Senate Democrats originally wanted at 6 trillion, we don't know for sure, but it's, it could be on the chopping block, but it's, it's a big piece of the, the Biden proposal. So I wouldn't expect that it would be, but it's a possibility. Thanks, Sarah. I think as most of us know, um, it, it's crucial because then the state Medicaid agencies look to the behavioral health authorities on, on that, whereas they normally, um, again, most states, they're thinking about um, LTSS and they're thinking about IDD and nursing home prevention and that type of thing. So this language has given us a real footing. So very important. Appreciate that. Absolutely. And if you have uh, contacts that you, you know, your state senators that you think are maybe on the fence or could use a little um, encouragement, showing your support, not in any sort of threatening way, but showing your support for the program um, in an email, you know, does not hurt just to, to put that in there over the next couple of weeks. Um, but that, that is an important piece of the, the Biden plan. And that was on the chopping block for the Part, bipartisan package because of how low that figure was and that you weren't gonna get a lot of Senate uh, Republican support for it. 
there is a lot more support among the Democratic Senate caucus. So we'll keep our eyes out for that. And I will, of course, keep everybody updated as soon as we learn more. Uh, Mike Hogan, are you with us by chance? And thank you, Wendy and Sarah. Mike, are you with us? I don't see Mike jumping in, but I think, you know, the comment I'd look to Mike for is uh, we're talking about in several of these areas funding that's twice to, to 10 times or funding that just didn't even exist before that is beginning to amass behind this effort. And it's all unprecedented and amazing and also uh, not what is needed to fully fuel the promise of 988. So it's a uh, an enormous tension that we're in right now, an opportunity that we continue to talk about. So great, great stuff. I see Connor uh, making a comment. Connor, Connor, anything that you would add in, uh, from AFSP's perspective into uh, what's going on right now? Hey, David, just uh, zooming in, but uh, I'm no longer uh, with AFSP. I believe that uh, Taylor uh, Cleffel and, and Natalie Teacher on the phone, just really uh, excited about the, about the news on the legislative front. Terrific. Uh, uh, any any uh, update or, or comment from Taylor or Natalie? Um, I don't think we have anything today. Natalie had another meeting, um, but she'll be back next week. Great. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Karen. And uh, Laura, are you, well, actually, uh, uh, Sarah, anything you want to uh, note about this? It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to even keep track of what's going on right now. That's completely fair. And when I saw this screen pop up, I forgot that I probably put this together less than two days ago and I completely forgot that I had. So at this point, I took a look through also the house earmark requests and they were calling them community um, project funding. Um, and for transparency's sake, they, they posted everything online that they had picked to get funded as part of this HHS labor education bill. Um, I went through and did a quick search for anything talking about crisis, crisis response, cri uh, crisis stabilization, and there were a number of these local community projects, also known as earmark uh, requests, that were actually funded as part of this bill. Um, and just looking through the list of, of things that have made, made it through, it really seems like this, this crisis moment has been lifted, and this seems to be a real focus among a lot of these local um, requests that have been granted by the, by the house. Terrific. Next slide. Uh, Laura Evans, are you with us from Vibrant? Uh, not a lot changing, but any comments? Uh, Laura, are you there to make a comment on the map? Yes, thank you, David. Not a lot changing. You know, I will echo um, Dr. Hepburn's cautious uh, optimism from earlier. I think states are feeling uh, in a much better position uh, for both uh, the studies for the states that have issued studies, as well as planning for next session. So I do think we will continue to see a robust um, a flurry of legislative activity come next session, but we are still waiting for um, New York and Oregon bills to be delivered uh, to the governors and signed in those respective states. And I know several other states are continuing to um, Con convene stakeholders to get really comprehensive uh, legislation drafted. So hopefully we will see some more changes um, as well as California. Uh, that uh, bill has not been scheduled for a Senate hearing yet. Um, as of last, I checked with the California stakeholders and we will be seeing a hearing in Massachusetts. And I know a lot of groups, national groups on this call will be participating in that as well. Terrific. Thanks so much, Laura. And I know Angela is not with us from NAMI, but NAMI's continued to provide us their tracking information as well as this map, which has been super helpful. Uh, and again, we will be working with other parties and, and, and looking at the work that NAMI and, and, and Vibrant and others are doing to track not this map, but ultimately the map that reflects the uh, proportion of required funding necessary to do this work. Uh, that's coming to the table. And uh, we've already got a start to that uh, with, with this effort. Uh, next slide, Karen. And this is the, uh, again, Tom, you, you've already referenced this, but let's go to the next slide, uh, Karen. Tom, anything you would add? Uh, we did share this Indiana view, uh, which is their proposed spending plan. Next slide, Karen. Uh, I, 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 there were a number of bullets underneath this building provider capacity, Tom, but you pointed us to the crisis system and support. Yeah, David. So again, you know, just speaking to one specific state plan where they called out 
investments that they were going to make with regards to expanding crisis system and being able to implement 988. So I think, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a sort of a model approach in terms of how to think about leveraging HCBS funding. And it's critical that states be thinking about this, not only in terms of the context of this three-year planning window that they have with the current 10% bump, but as we look ahead to the infrastructure bill, states should be focused on the language that's in 2210, getting an understanding of what the requirements are to be able to continue that 10%. David, you talked about the ongoing need for resources to support this infrastructure. Clearly that 10% ongoing HCBS funding um, and particularly the behavioral health rehab option is important. And if you're state leaders, you wanna make sure that you're looking at, okay, are we putting all the behavioral health services that we can under the rehab option? Not all states leverage the rehab option. Um, and so states are going to want to be looking at that, especially if Congress is going to make an ongoing investment in terms of funding for that. And so that can become an ongoing funding stream to be able to support crisis services. But again, uh, Indiana specifically called out the crisis now model. They're going to be making an investment in that. And then going forward, because they have the rehab option in Indiana, if, if the infrastructure bill includes additional funding for HCBS, they're well positioned to be able to leverage additional funding to help support that crisis infrastructure. And those are the types of things that really provide such a unique opportunity for states uh, in this moment in time to be able to, to seize the moment and, and grab some financing streams to support the entire model. So, Tom, what is the, I see the 900 uh, million at the bottom here. What is the, is that the level of new funding or is it this uh, 220? Well, the level million? of new What's funding, the, the level of new funding that Indiana had to invest in HCBS was 877 million, which is the sum of all these. It. And it's the bottom of this line. The piece that they're putting towards building provider capacity is 263 million. And crisis was one of four items that they identified as part of spending that 263 million. They did not delineate the specific dollar amount for crisis. Uh, right. That'll be coming right. in, in future plans as they work to fine tune this, but it was one of four items that they identified in building capacity in which they're investing you know, 30% or 263 million dollars of their plan. So this is a tangible investment that would certainly tangible. Uh, be be on par with uh, Arizona's total investment or beyond it, uh, just from this effort alone? Well, remember, there's other items that are part of that $263 million. Right. We don't know right. what's actually being invested in crisis, but it has the potential to you know, uh, grow quickly in terms of the overall dollar amounts. And then you know, that's just building it. Then the, service, the services can build Medicaid and other funding streams once they're up and running potentially. Terrific. Thank you, Tom. Next slide, Karen. And I, I want to just spend a minute on this next slide, but I do want to tee up future conversations and some uh, possibly crisis talk interviews and featured presentations. So we've talked a lot about the LOCUS as a level of care clinical framework uh, and where communities are, are using LOCUS in their crisis engagement. It gives them the capability of looking at ROI, appropriate placement, uh, and an accountability for the, the inputs that is far beyond a system with pure clinical judgment, which tends to lean toward either inpatient or outpatient as your two options. But Dr. John Franklin Sierra, you've, you've been a featured presenter twice on this call. Uh, LA County recently went with Interqual uh, instead of Locus. Uh, and there is another major player in the field with Milliman. I just saw an article that United Healthcare has switched uh, its entire operations. You talked about a hundred billion dollar plus health plan, which has moved from Milliman to uh, to Interqual. And I didn't realize all of the reason for that, except I, they also uh, acquired Interqual, so they now own uh, the product. But John, can you just give a couple of comments uh, because you did have to pay for Interqual in a way that uh, Locus is more open source. I've got the asterisk related to the electronic version. Uh, but you did pay for this, and I'd, I'd love people to just hear a couple of comments on, on why you went that direction. Thanks, David. And yeah, I mean, we actually evaluated all three of these products when we were trying to decide on a utilization management tool for us and, you know, completely, you know, agree that we, we felt it was really needed to get a better sense of just what, you know, what are the needs that we have for different, you know, buckets of care and, you know, uh, help make the argument for, you know, 
building more parts of our of our continuum and um you know we evaluated all these and you know really felt like interqual and locus were uh, a better match in terms of the way the clinical assessment is set up for our clients, you know, much more focused on intensity of service needs, functional impairment, um, you know, and for our client population in particular, where, you know, diagnosis isn't always as reliable of an indicator of need. Um, we, we really liked that. And then it was just a matter of looking at, you know, ease of use of the tool and user friendliness and, you know, speed of being able to adapt to it. And one of the unique considerations for our organization was just, you know, we're, I think, a fairly immature organization when it comes to using tools like this. And so we really wanted to invest in something to, you know, that was extremely user friendly to get us started um, and really liked the electronic implementation of Interqual and their interface for using their tool. Um, but again, also really liked Locus, the, the, the clinical parts of the tool just, you know, um, ended up going with Interqual for the, for those reasons. And the tertiary benefit was one of our sister organizations, uh, the Department of Health Services for the LA County uses Interqual as well. Well, more to come. I just wanted to sort of tee that up. Uh, we've, we've not laid out these three options and I thought it was worth uh, discussion. So John, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And Karen, on to our featured presenter, Dr. Anitra Warrior. We're gonna go straight into this. We did introduce you with a crisis talk. Uh, so thankful that Shelby brought you uh, and your uh, leadership and, and work to our, our effort. Uh, and uh, your innovation continues with this idea of an all nations crisis hotline. I uh, love to hear uh, what that is, where it's at and where you see this going. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I loved being able to see Stephanie's uh, face. We've talked so much, um, but I don't think we did um, any Zoom meeting. So it was very nice to, to see you, Stephanie. Um, so yeah, thank you again for allowing me this time to present. Um, I'm always honored to be able to do that because of the concerns that we have in terms of representation. So uh, before I move, move forward, I just wanted to um, take a quick moment to acknowledge my ancestors and those that have paved the path for me to be where I am today, the guidance that's been offered through them, because within our cultures, you know, we are all connected, we are all related, and I'm thankful to be here and for what they've given to me in my life. So as we move forward, um, or before we switch over to the next slide, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. If you read the article, you probably know a ton of personal information about me, <laughs> But um, so again, Dr. Nitra Warrior, I'm from the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, and I'm a psychologist based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Now we have about five clinics that serve rural communities as well as reservations. And um, we have been providing telehealth well before the pandemic hit. Um, and that was through our partnership with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So along with focusing on our indigenous populations, we really look out for our rural populations as well. And this is something that stays in my mind um, when we're talking about 988 and how the services are going to be provided, uh, specifically with our tribal communities. So uh, one of the concerns, and we could go ahead and go to the next slide. I could pull up my presentation. Oh, great. Perfect. Okay. So as I mentioned, equity is huge in this. And um, it, some of the differences that, that we see are going to be that relationship between 988 and 911. And we know that 988 is going to be just, you know, that crisis talk line. But when we start looking at how we coordinate services on our reservations, at least here in Nebraska, and I know that this is in other locations, 911 is not accessible to us. We can call 911, we're asked if we're on a reservation, and then we're redirected to call our local police departments. And those will be our tribal police departments. Now, within those tribal police departments, we have extreme shortages of law enforcement officers. So we may have one to two that are available. And when we're looking at emergency situations to where someone needs to be hospitalized, if we have one to two officers covering an entire reservation and they're having to travel up to six hours to have someone hospitalized, we're putting the rest of the community at risk. So there is a lot for us to take into consideration as we move forward with 988 um, and our crisis line as well. 
So this is all based on equity. Right now, we have are we are doing our best to try and increase the number of providers that we have available across the state of Nebraska. There are many efforts the state is taking to increase that, including student loan uh, repayment programs that are very nice, very flexible to really be um, attractive to potential providers. It's still a challenge, though, for us to recruit and retain in some of these rural areas as well as our reservations. So we've had, as I mentioned here on this slide, we've had um, consistency with the low uh, levels of accessibility to care. So this is what we're working towards improving. So uh, we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So with um, the work that we do, so I mentioned that I'm um, with Morningstar Counseling. So that's a clinic that I own. And last year, in response to the uh, the pandemic, of course, but the overt racism that we saw, the challenges with police, and what we experienced here in Nebraska in terms of some of our young um, students that were part of the uh, BLM movement and, and protests were receiving death threats. And these were for our high school students. And it, it got to that level of severity within our small communities. And so we had a number of people that were reaching out to us because we don't have a lot of um, BIPOC uh, providers across the state of Nebraska. So we were kind of the go-to in that sense. And so we responded by forming this nonprofit, which is Healing Roots Inc. And um, the mission statement is um, on a couple of slides later, but um, this was really for us to be able to work with um, other communities, establish partnerships to be able to provide clinical services for free. And so far that's, that's worked out nicely for us. And we have other providers, even from out of state, who are volunteering their time. They're licensed in Nebraska, but live out of state, but they're willing to provide services to support our population. So we're very thankful for that and the partnerships that were established through Healing Roots. So um, Morningstar is a part of that just because of, of my role, but we are actually kind of a conglomerate basically of the tribes as well as these additional entities. So right now the All Nations Crisis Line is literally being funded by the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska. Last year, they had a wave of, um, well, a cluster, I should say, of suicides that took place. And this ranged from 13 years old up to um, mid 40s, uh, male and female. And it was just a very distressing time. It still is for the community. Um, and, you know, they were very severe in terms of how um, the deaths occurred and the number of attempts that happened um, after that as well, including in the schools and the number of kids that were traumatized by what they were exposed to. So um, they've been very responsive in trying to find innovative ways to serve their people because not all the services that are available through the state um, are available to the tribes. So it's a diff very difficult challenge, especially when we are citizens of the state of Nebraska, but we're still not afforded all of those rights. So um, we also do significant partnerships with the Society of Care, um, which is under the Santee Sioux Nation. And I recognize them and their work because they've had the foresight to partner or to write grants that um, have been awarded through SAMHSA, but to where they are providing services statewide through us um, for all tribal nations um, at no charge. So we've, you know, really thinking about what services look like, what service delivery looks like when we're serving our tribal nations, because it is very different. And David, as you mentioned earlier, that level of connection, this is something that is very important for us in the work that we do. We don't refer to anyone that we're working with as clients or patients. We refer to them as our relatives. And we take that very seriously in terms of us being on call for them, the level of availability, the cultural um, appropriateness of how we operate is um, woven into everything that we do. 
So in addition to that, because of the relationships that we've had with the tribes, we've been able to have um, a number of other communities that are in support of us that um, really try to coordinate services and um, have called upon us for various reasons. So we've uh, really focused on those partnerships and those relationships and building upon those. In the bottom left, you will see um, our logo for All Nations Crisis Hotline. So we've really tried to tailor this to fit our population. So it represents a couple of things. So one is the text box. So if you're you were able to kind of catch that with the circles there, that would be representing the text box. And the picture, the turquoise color would represent a feather. And um, for us, it would be representing an eagle feather. And for many tribes, they have different um, meanings, but across the country, this is a very um, important relative for us. So that was our um, mission with this particular logo. So I wanted to share it. I think it's um, very fitting for the work that we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I'm going to have to apologize now because I think I messed up on some of the timing. So I actually have a session at noon. So I'm going to fly through some of this and try to allow us some time for questions if there are any. Um, so I've already talked to you about healing roots. I think this will be shared. So if you want to read the mission statement that's there, um, all nations crisis hotline that is established is under healing roots. And it is again, a text-based crisis service that is operated specifically and only by natives from this area. Now, as we expand, um, we're already seeing that it's gonna be very difficult trying to contain this to one tribe, but that's really just kind of our pilot project. In about six months, we, we plan to go further. So we wanna work it out with this tribe and then be able to expand. So um, we're, we're excited about that, but we're recognizing like, oh, wow, this is really gonna move quickly. So, um, and in that, I think we've probably broken some records in, in terms of um, how quickly we got this line established. So <laughs> um, we could go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so with our with us actually doing this in terms of a product, we had started out by contacting SPRC um, Shelby through um, the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and this was probably about three months ago. I want to say I, I literally think it was about three months ago that we had our first contact. She con. Um, coordinated other uh, meetings for us. And we started meeting with different people um, from crisis lines over the next two weeks. And we got connected with Chris Lee or Christopher, he goes by Vu as well, Gandon Lee. And so he has just been amazing for us to work with. And we um, were able to move forwarding. We have um, billboards that will be, put together here on the reservation. Uh, we have our website together, which I'll show you a picture of as well. Um, and so all of these things are ready to go. We have the marketing down. It's just, we want our final approval from their tribal council and then it will be going out. So we're um, taking these steps. Um, I already talked about the design um, and how we've really built upon the relationships that we've already had. So I think if we were brand new, um, we probably wouldn't have been able to do this so quickly, but because we have these relationships with the tribes, with the state, um, and we're seen as relatives, I think that's really made a huge difference for us. So um, I Oh, that's, that tentative date is wrong. So we are looking at August 2nd as our date. So we are ready to go now, but we've had to wait on the tribal council to uh, make that approval for us to go ahead and launch. So that should actually be August 2nd that we will move forward with launching. Oops, uh, next slide. Thank you. So this is a um, what our website will look like. So it is allnationscrisishotline.org. And right now we have um, posted our 10-digit long code. That will be changing um, in August, hopefully, because uh, it takes a little bit to secure that short code. So um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, that will be available. But just to be able to get the service available as quickly as possible, we're using the long code. Um, the short code will be, and I, 
I'm sorry, it's escaping me now. I think it's in my um, trying to move forward quickly. 34464 is our uh, short code. So we'll be making sure that we share that with you. But I just wanted you to be able to see um, the website that will be available. Hopefully we can have that um, up and running um, as soon as the Tribal Council approves that by the end of the week. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as I had shared, um, 33464 is our, is our short code. And so um, this is our contact information. As I mentioned, the 10 digit long code is going to be temporary. Um, and then we have our uh, website available that will hopefully be live by Friday. Um, there is my contact information as well as our lead counselor. Um, and again, these are all, everyone who is staffing our crisis line is native. They are from Nebraska. They have um, very unique under understandings of what happens within our tribal communities, you know, so as they're going through the, the training for uh, the crisis counselors, they're able to bring to those trainings unique perspectives from reservations. So the role plays have changed dramatically based on what we experience in our communities. And had we not been, been a part of that or, you know, even asked to be able to, to do that, our training would be limited. And so I think we've also enhanced services for others that are serving people in different states as well. So we're very excited about that. And um, I can go ahead and open it up for questions. And I, again, I apologize for my misunderstanding on the time. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're spot on, Dr. Warrior. Thanks so much for your leadership here. It's really this extension of the promise of 988 just cascading forward and, and people taking that and running with it. Shelby, are you with us for a quick comment? Yes, I am. Um, I think that it doesn't take much explanation of why, you know, I wholeheartedly got behind um, what Dr. Warrior has been working on. Um, her group is doing outstanding work. And happy that the rest of you have seen this because uh, there are unique problems, uh, unique challenges in serving tribal populations, but there's also some really creative, unique solutions. Um, the individuals and organizations, you know, like Dr. Warrior and organizations uh, really coming together to serve our families, to serve our relatives. And I think there's lessons for all rural uh, mental health service providers as we move towards the launch of 988. Love it, Shelby. And, and Representative Orwell, I saw your comment, but the Washington state legislation did bake in a, a similar type effort. You want to make a quick comment? Wonderful. Yes. And uh, there was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Dr. Warrior. And we really um, luckily had a partnership already going on with Volunteers of America and the tribes and our, our Department of Health and Healthcare Authority. And what we were able to do is take a kind of a small project they were working on and infuse it with $988 to really allow for a 24 seven tribal line uh, as a linkage to services. So we're really proud. They've done a lot of great work and I, we really hope this moves forward quickly. Well, thank you for sharing that. So Dr. Warrior, thanks so much for your effort and we'll, we'll look forward to hearing updates as, as you continue to expand this effort, not only in Nebraska and uh, with, with the tribes where you've started, but potentially as this uh, idea expands. Uh, Karen, can we go to the next slide? I wanna uh, make sure we give an update on the pipeline that's coming. Uh, thanks, thanks Shelby for uh, your continued leadership and the University of Oklahoma working with SPRC. This is gonna, yield all kinds of exciting uh, extensions, uh, Shelby, as, uh, as we lean into some of these key areas. Next slide, Karen. Just to give you a little sense of the uh, timetable coming up, uh, we do have Tequila Terry and Megan Renfrew from the Maryland uh, effort that is putting millions into three pilot programs. We've heard about uh, the, I believe it's called G-Bricks, uh, uh, one of the three major pilots in Maryland, but there are three uh, that are coming. And these uh, more healthcare, Medicaid related investments are really spectacular. So we'll get more information from them uh, this coming week, as well as in, in weeks to come, uh, discussions of the uh, CCBHC integration with 911 in Austin, Texas. Uh, we had Derek, uh, Dr. Eric 
Ralph Lawan, uh, who was highlighted nationally for some efforts around race and equity uh, that we'll bring on. And then we'll be back to Wendy Tigreen with more uh, a follow up to a terrific peer supports presentation that she did some weeks ago. So again, please let us know as you have ideas of key content or speakers. Uh, we want to highlight the innovations that we see in the space as well as continue to bring a, a focus on lived lens. So thanks for everyone for joining us and hoping to see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.